you're sitting, it's warm. So, um, I've read it a few times, but uh, I don't know, it's been really helpful for me to read it, just as a writer. So. Uh, my last letter to you. Once before the rest, I thought in some strange how that it would work out by some feat of trickery or cunning or some genuine realized persistence and great care, the story that it would later become, told too many times over anything handy, would end entirely different. Then we would know it, or would later, and all the disagreements of why and the anger of how evaporating up, up beyond us and out, I thought, even the smell, the musk of our distrust and love so closely interwoven with hate would go. And we would sit in the clear of what? And in that absence, laugh. Laugh the laugh of people fully aware of their own stupidity and cruelty and the thankful laugh of this, that, and all that would and did and will pass. And all that vanished. The permission of our own happiness granted, wrestled from the tight-fisted bouncer at the door who would let us enter into another more private room where alone we could sit and... What? Could sit and what? <laughs> it's always at this part during my letters to you that there, and there have been several, that I wonder what, what would we say? How could we sit in the same room together, even in imaginary, vaguely and vaguely, in the sense that the whole structure of the thing is not very good, but metaphorically is probably like room, and just be, what? How to all that history, how to deny all that was? And I'm not speaking of forgiveness. Forgiveness is easy. It's the ability to withdraw malice, or understand it at least. This is dissection, this is extraction, this is an amputation. To look at the action, the sore, the word, the rolling eyes at a dinner party, that cancer of your silence, or that unpaid, lied about internet bill, and acknowledge the curse or the limp, and cut it off. Throw it away, garbage off the side of this forward-moving ship. It's a long trail, drifting, 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 until it meets up with the continent of garbage in the Pacific that no one talks about. <laughs> but Ryan thinks we'll all end up living on, which seems a little much, but then he says we have no idea what's coming, and I know he's right. I guess I started writing letters because I wanted sure closure, not closure, but closure really, I mean, that's the biggest lie there is. No one ever, nothing, no one, not one single person has ever, will ever want closure. In the classic sense of lifetime movies or some other shit or daytime television meant to remind women homebound that their lives, if they want them, are their own, are theirs a possession like a commemorative plate or a porcelain doll. These still reminders of 19 easy payments, headstones of moments gone. It's not closure, it's grasping under glass. They never tell them or even hint at the fact that some choices you don't make. And often those are the ones that lay down the most bricks on your road. I'm not just speaking of negative things. Please understand that I am not a fatalist or a nihilist. I believe there will be another day for me, perhaps even for you. But another day for someone else is still up for grabs. The open closure of release. The gone, but not the other kind. Not the kind of stamp, the labeling of done, complete. The cases of either. Not the amputation of history. No one really wants that. We long for the phantom pains. We want to do it again, to go back and be loved. Want the life that was promised us. The limery groan that we can run through sunny meadows of the past and smile in the face of all the terrible fate, the loss of so much that was all just a dream of buying only one sock. Or we want blood, 
dripping carnage, recompense, organs splayed across the linoleum floor like the time Heather dropped a turkey for Thanksgiving in the apartment on 7th. Except it wouldn't be funny and you wouldn't be drunk, and you would have picked it up before anybody saw, laughing as you washed it in the sink too small for both your hands. You want blood, admit it. And the sticky thud of meat on the ground, death, but more so than death, we want destruction, evisceration, entrails exposed, and falling out as his terrified hands grasp, trying to collect them, to hold in his liver or intestines as gravity pulls his guts out in a disgusting sleep of failure. Humans are kept together with scotch tape and hope, never forget that. He won't. And you won't, because it's what you wanted. I'm not bloodthirsty, I'm just tactile. Mm -hmm. I want the feel of it, not the moral obligation or the nightmare of cleaning it up. Even mentally, which I'm sure has its own set of pitfalls unless you're a sociopath, which I would imagine in that line of work, the line of work splaying people pelvis to sternum in your old apartment on 7th with a linoleum floor and watching them die in the agonizing struggle to keep their internal organs from becoming external would be a bonus, a necessity really, being a sociopath, hmm. not connected, not caring, seeing life as a thing like the flooring or the small sink or something, a noun, anything disposable, said or not. Useful only up to the point of its use. I would be annoyed, but it's my phone. <laughs> so, but no! <laughs> but no, I'm that. My torture lacks a cert of sophistication, at least for this pittance of revenge. My revenge would be a dream of prom. It's the mean pretty girl getting a drink thrown in her face with a perfect <laughs> line and the shot of you leaving with friends and lovers and her life ruined from ever, from the stain not only on her satina monstrosity but also <laughs> on her soul. You will take comfort from the fact that her story is over. That was the line and the drink you finished her and set her aside to roll around in the muck of her shame as she crawls through life, stained until death. <laughs> <laughs> Punished and out. Will I think of her in my palazzo in Tuscany? <laughs> With my tan skin and my flowing white robe, will you rub your slicked hair and take off your large black sunglasses and wonder about her? Or will we even know what we've done? The long, slow approach as opposed to the quick and messy. And we'll have another glass of champagne poured by our Spanish lovers and laugh at something funny Gorbidal said when he came and couldn't figure out the faucets in the downstairs bathroom. I have a manila folder full of half-written letters to you, in various inks, rehearsed with coolness and pleading, <coughs> trying to sound all right or better, even good. The solitary umbrella of my busyness or my success, keeping me dry from the storm of so many... Do I open with a joke? It seems typical and callous, the problem so often. Your earnestness made me laugh, the high squeal of your emphasis, the pinching of your fingers, as if you were holding the point right there, demanding me to look, but I always relaxed your grip and dropped it, thinking I knew better as it rolled under the couch and waited for me, laughing all the while, harder than I knew it knew. And when I packed my things, it would be there waiting to follow me out, wrapped in an old scarf and placed somewhere precious as a remnant of something lost itself being such a thing as that. Once I've thought about slowly, solely encompassing the letter in the point, wrapping it in my own words, sending it off to you to live in your hand again, though I imagine now you wouldn't clench it, you'd probably let it fall when you open the letter, dropping it all over again, if you opened it at all. The folder is you. My you has become my you, the only you I have left and have had for over a year. A collection of things my teeth ache to say hitting the table. 
that I bought and will never see again. Making some dash of criticism to you, screaming to be heard and the feeling of your kiss. You didn't really have an upper lip or were too delicate with it to be good. Feeling your hand in mine, the warmth of your body against me, uncomfortable for so many reasons which you talked and talked and talked about and which I listened to and didn't. Moonlight streaming in the broken window or probably just a street light, but I stray from the artificial out of principle in this and want some part of it to be real. And your enormous dick slapping against mine as you got on top of me and rode, 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 your eyes closed, hand grasping at my chest in big fistfuls, which took me completely out of it because I do not want to be possessed like that. But the soothing rhythm soon calm me and there will be other times. I can tell him later, let him finish, let him be happy. You came so hard, spraying me wet and happy and stuck together. But I didn't. My ejaculation being some sort of escape, as it is now, always, constantly, not wanting that then, or anything like it then, not wanting to be anywhere else, even then, then in that room with you grasping at me, even then, sticky and close, something akin to your need, momentarily watching my own. The quick flickering of the lights as you dressed, and I saw you naked and beautiful, all that I ever want and spoke the words out loud while the door was still closed and there still was a chance in my mind at that time. But you opened the door and left and it was the end. It was, not even looking back, not even the wizened eyes of all that followed, the glimpse in the light of a mistake. You opened the door and left to work and I smiled so widely at the doom to come, hoping that somehow that, what, the rest was tears, real on a few occasions, but mostly the squishing of face to capture the upset, to try to force them out, the lump that sticks in my throat since 1970. I well at commercials, but real tears have only come in three times and they were all connected with death. The gradual walking away from me and the man you hated or loved, it's always unclear. We were united, at least in that, our unclarity. And you ran back to him and I tried running away, hating him for not what he was, but what he made me. The truth living somewhere in between. My own sociopathy and shame. And the day we met in the park after so much silence and you said words I wanted to hear, but the line reading was off, <laughs> and you left after pressing your hand to my knees, which was strange and docile and referential as if I was ever asking for that. The death of it all hanging in the air, or welled and squished until the flow of few droplets escaped me, and it was over. Complete, except for the pain. And the text, in the morning your underwear was all over the living room and you hid in the, his bed and I waited for you, waited for you to come out and say, yes, I did this and I wanted to and it's done. <laughs> Would that have been closure? Would Oprah have applauded that? I don't know and I don't care. Maybe I wanted blood. I left, I came home to a family who loved me for something and they imagined me to be, which I am not. And turned off the lights because my Dorian looks at the mirror and there's no attic, just a bathroom. The blood will only be mine. And when I came back to New York, I came to the water, which I asked to see every day, was old, but was always denied me and sat amongst it with kind eyes of a friend swaying in the murkiness of our own terrible decisions. Stayed away from others out of the fear that they, all the they that they are, would know about you and what. And in the bow of a boat on the Hudson, I closed my eyes under a scratchy blanket and saw only you slightly, then him and me and all and nothing, nothing. I would have drowned if it were not for the fear of the cold then. I sat on the side hoping to draw my breath up and submerge, but the cold, the great chill, right before a hurricane kept me seated. 
the wind pushing me with icy palms blowing over the fallings of my hair and the sight from my eyes in that moment. I did not see anything but the water and tried, really, truly tried, but could not. A failing added to a long list of so many and went home to my mother with a smile of pity. Always pity because she's the one who made me and knows in words she can't understand the truth. It was there I began the letters. You are all ends, my therapist told me. And she's right, even the man I had bareback sex with and finally understood what all the fuss was about in 1983. The precarious need for skin. And she said with her eye-twitching green vest that I should look further, my father being an M2, but I changed the subject and talked about Jeffrey Dahmer, which ended things for both of us. <laughs> Me being someone who needs to say awfulness, like popping a zit, which is much more fun than healthful, and she not seeing humor in my self-deprecation, leading me to compare myself with a cannibal. He was not an attractive man, but he got all those guys back to the apartment. <laughs> she said I was a good patient, and I knew I was smarter than her, so who cared what she thought? And why did she always have the same shoes? And writing you... The dream of flickering light in your brown, smooth skin and holding you in the blue street moonlight. And you're warning me to go, warning me to run, and maybe wanting just that. But I'm a sad person, and we walk mostly in circles. Great landscapes on the moon looking for something lost, but what is it? What is it? What? I wrote only to you. Then more. Paragraphs renouncing or hating you, proving and scribble that I and I and I was right, was irreproachable. The victor in a war long over and bodies long buried, something only remembered on stamps or at banks. And I thought of new M's, M who doesn't want me but wants my cock, who I cannot talk to unless on Facebook, which has no grandeur in it, no sense. I have this over-identification with handwriting, which is why I write through to you. For someone of even my failed romanticism, it all seems like drivel. What was is always the question. Why being false and who being subjective? What lies in your hands? And being tactile, it's my comfort and my weapon to cut only myself and grasp after the fall.